pick new habits that you want, not new habits that you feel like you should have or should be doing. So shoulds almost never become true habits. So instead, focus on what you want and make those things into habits rather than, oh, I should be walking on the stair master an hour a day. No, pick a different way to have physical activity that you like doing, that you want to do. A question asked courageously, answered honestly, and lived authentically can change your whole life. For me, that question was, how can I use what I have, what I love, and what I know to bless the lives of others? The School for Good Living and this podcast are one answer to that question. Hi, I'm Brian Miller. I know that the world can work for everyone, but that it won't until it works for you. I've created this to help you make the difference you were born to make. It's a series of conversations with thought leaders who are moving humanity forward. And in each episode, I explore their lives and the work they do. I also ask them to break down how they've gotten their books written, published, and read. This podcast is all about exploring the magic and mystery, and sometimes the misery, of the creative process. So if you have a mission, a message, and the motivation to share it, this podcast is for you. Welcome to the School for Good Living. If you're looking to better understand the mysteries of human behavior, your own behavior, you will enjoy today's episode. Today, I talk with BJ Fogg. He founded the Behavior Design Lab at Stanford University, and he teaches industry innovators how human behavior really works. He's coached more than 40,000 people on behavior design, how to change behavior, what really causes us to act. BJ has created something he calls the Fog Behavior Model. And it's one of those things that is so simple, but it's so profound, it's so powerful, that tells us how human behavior really works. If you are in product design, if you are in a leadership role, if you're curious about why you do the things you do or why you don't do the things you think you wanna do, or how you can get yourself to stop doing certain other things, this conversation in this book will be very valuable for you. BJ, in addition to being a super nice guy, very thoughtful, very intelligent, very educated, very experienced, is here to share with us a number of ideas that we can apply immediately to improve the quality of our lives. So I think in any given generation, in any field, there are only a handful of teachers that are as gifted as BJ is. And if you are in a field of helping people, then I think you'll find this work very useful. If you want to learn more about BJ, if you want to jump right to or connect with him, you can go to, you can find him on the web at bjfog.com. That's fog with two G's or at tinyhabits.com. And as he discusses in this interview, you can also listen to the introduction of his book read by him on Audible for free. The introduction is free. It's 14 minutes long. Then you can decide if you want to continue listening to the book. I highly recommend it. All right. With that, I hope you enjoy this conversation with my new friend, BJ Fogg. BJ, welcome to the School for Good Living. Thank you. I am so happy to be here. I'm so glad you're here. BJ, will you tell me, please, what's life about? Oh, you know, I think life, that's a tough question, but if I had to put it, it, life is really about helping and serving other people in ways that we are uniquely qualified to do, if you can find that. And if you can't, Mm. then it's just get out there and help people be happier and healthier. Mm. I understand that you live by the credo, strengthen others every day. Yes. You know, my niece wrote me a letter once. And in the letter, she said, strengthen others in all your interactions. She was quoting something. And I just picked up on that a few years ago. And it's like, yeah, that's really what I'm trying to do every day. And so my colleague, Stephanie, I said, and she works with me usually by my side, but not during COVID. It's like, Stephanie, this is what we're doing. We're in all our interactions. We're trying to strengthen people. And so she is this great artist and she painted me a painting with that on it. So in my home in California, I have a painting on the wall that says that. And it's a great thing to remember, especially when you get frustrated or especially (laughs) when it's like you're exhausted or... And even in the smallest of moments, like this morning, there was somebody, so I'm in Maui now and I surf every morning and I was getting out and there was a guy there that I hadn't talked to in the water because we're surfing. But then I just said a simple thing that strengthened him and it was so easy to do, but it brought us closer and I hopefully I helped his day get off to a better start. Yeah, that's so wonderful. And before we go any further, in case it wasn't already clear, I feel like I had to just put this in here that 
It's going to be a great show. <laughs> <laughs> we are going to have fun. I'm going to share stuff I've never shared before. I'm going to, you've been so good in coordinating and helping me get here that let's go to the edges, you know, awesome. and let, let's, let's push me and hopefully I won't fall off the edge. You can pull me back if I get too crazy. There are professionals standing by. We have all the <laughs> requisite gear, so let's we're good. <laughs> okay. Well, with that, we're going to go right into the enlightening lightning round. So again, this oh. is a variety of questions. They're intended to be short questions. You're welcome to answer as long as you want. But for my part, I'm going to ask the question and stand aside. Okay. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to try to answer each one in one breath. Okay. Holy cow. Okay. <laughs> so that will limit me. We'll see if that works. So hopefully I can do that and give a quality question. Let's see how this goes. Okay. I mean, a quality answer. <laughs> and, and, and a breath for each question, not one breath for all questions. No, right? for every answer, I get one, okay. Okay. Uh, one breath. Fair enough. It in. Okay. The first question, please complete the following sentence with something other than a box of chocolates. <laughs> Life is like a... Life is like a bunch of opportunities coming your way all the time, like you're at a batting range and all these balls are flying at you and you have to choose which ones to pay attention to and which ones to bunt on and which ones to hit out of the park. And that deciding and that prioritizing is tough, but it's so essential. Mm -hmm. All right. One breath. <laughs> well done. Okay. Question number two. Here I'm borrowing Peter Thiel's famous question. What important truth do very few people agree with you on? Well, right now, it's probably the fact that emotions create habits because so many people have believed the traditional wisdom that it's repetition. But in my book, Tiny Habits, and in my teaching now, I'm showing how it's emotions create habits. It's not repetition. And I'm hoping in five or 10 years from now, the whole ecosystem of, I ran out of breath. Okay. <laughs> it's that. There it is. Okay. I ran out of breath. That Fill emotion in the blanks, creates everybody. habits. Emotions create habits. Yeah. And I, it's really important to have people understand that it's not repetition, that it's emotions. Yeah. You're designing for emotions yeah. and you can do it through positive emotions. And where I got that, like, you know, if I had any question about whether or not that was accurate, where you clarified that for me was when you said, put a smartphone in a teenager's hand. How many yeah. times does that require? You know, it's not repetition one time. Right. Right. Yeah. And so there's more to this and we could do the whole, the whole podcast <laughs> on this, but yeah. it's a real, if this is news to anybody listening, please look into it and please understand that you can create habits by feeling good. You don't have to use willpower or beat yourself up or blame yourself. You change best by feeling good. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Question number three, if you were required every day for the rest of your life to wear a t-shirt with a slogan on it or a phrase or a saying or a quote or a quip, what would the shirt say? It might be just that. You change best by feeling good, not by feeling bad. That is hopefully a message of, I'm still on one breath there. That's hopefully <laughs> a message of hope for people and also gets them to dig in and get started and not procrastinate change because you can do it by feeling good. Yeah, no, I love that. And, and by the way, I do just want to tug on that for a moment. One of my teachers once pointed out, look, if flogging ourselves, if beating ourselves up or putting ourselves down worked yeah. to bring about behavior change, we all would have succeeded long ago. <laughs> <laughs> so no, I'm, I'm with like you on that. that one. I like that. Okay. Question number four, what book other than your own, have you gifted or recommended most often? If you look at back in the past 10 years, it's probably a book called Don't Shoot the Dog by Karen Pryor. And it's ostensibly a dog training manual, but it's really a book about operant conditioning and how you can shape behavior in by using these powerful principles. Now, I'm not a behaviorist, but it's important to understand these concepts. Still one breath. And this book is the quickest, fastest, most fun way of doing that. Thank you. Okay. Question number five. So this one's about travel, you know, way back in the good old days where we did that kind <gasps> of thing. <laughs> yeah. I was reading something about that existed once. Yeah. I'm, I'm confident it will be here again, <laughs> but the question is this, what's one travel hack, meaning something you do or something you take with you when you travel to make your travel less painful or more enjoyable. 
I have many, many travel hacks and some of them are ordinary, but I'm gonna show you one that is not ordinary and I have to step away from the mic, but I'll continue to talk and <laughs> use my one breath and keep it going. I'm back to the mic and one of my travel hacks is bringing these two plush toys with me, frog and monkey, and I use them in my talks and I set them in the hotel room. It's goofball, but it makes me feel calm and it's playful. So I got to know the frog and the monkey. What's that about? Is this the angel and the devil or what is this? No, well, they're characters. So when I give a keynote, I like using stories and examples. And the stories and examples are about frog and monkey. And then I also, before I talk, I put them on the podium because people are like, oh, there's a Stanford res researcher coming up here. And it's like, what are those stuffed animals doing up there? So it helps kind of wake people up and say, look, this is not going to be a boring talk. We're going to have fun. But it's really so I can tell stories like monkey did this, frog did that. One worked, one didn't. Let's talk about, about what worked and what didn't. So now I got to know what's what's one of those, what's one of your favorite stories that you tell with those two? One of them, it has to do with them deciding to get stronger and monkey decides to lift a fifth. Oh, here's monkey. Monkey decides to, <laughs> do I look like Mr. Rogers here? A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I am accused of that, yes. So monkey decides to lift a super heavy kettlebell twice a day, where frog picks light kettlebell once a day, and then I have people predict who gets stronger in a year, and it's frog taking baby steps and not getting sore and not trying to overachieve. And that helps cue up the points I'm making about you can change in these small incremental ways that will have big impact, and here's how it works. Hmm. Right on. All right. Thank you for that. The question number six. What's one thing you've started or stopped doing in order to live or age well? There's a lot. I'll give one of each. I started surfing every morning. So we usually live in Maui half the year. Now we're here a lot because of COVID. So we've been here over a year. So surfing every morning is just a spiritual connecting experience for me. And plus it's great exercise. And there's also, also kind of a social component. So that's one breath. What I stopped. Dang, there's so many. I'm going to go here. Yeah, about two and a half years ago, I stopped drinking alcohol entirely. I didn't have this massive problem with it. I wasn't in AA, but there was just a time when I was like, this isn't serving me. So I stopped and I'm sharing this because my biggest lesson was one, it was easier than I thought. Two, the benefits are way bigger than I expected. And so I'm sharing it. It may not be the most interesting example, but I think it might help the most people who are kind of considering it. Yeah. Hey, people, there are so many benefits of just saying no to alcohol and just living your life without it. Yeah. I, I've i realized that for myself. I used to drink as well and, and I quit and it has nothing to do with morality or anything. I just realized my life works better when I don't drink. Yeah. 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 It's so, when you're on the other side of it, it's so hard to see that. And uh, so you, in some ways, people have to take a leap of faith, but it's just, there's just, if somebody had sat me down and said, BJ, here are all the benefits you'll experience, bam, 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 bam. It would have been bigger than I expected. And I might not have believed it, but that was my, the thing that has just, the thing that surprised me the most was like, oh my gosh, why didn't anybody tell me? <laughs> yeah. Did, did you lose weight? I know it's an easy way to drink a lot of sugar quickly. People um, don't often think about yeah, that. Yeah. I had already lost all the weight I wanted to lose by that point, you know, tiny habits and dialing in my eating behavior and everything like that. So I was already at the weight I wanted to be at. And so it really wasn't a weight loss thing. The thing that, well, it really opened the door to being active in the morning and being a hundred percent, whether it's like a business meeting or surfing or yeah. hanging out with my partner, there was just, there was never, I know I'm never going to have a morning where I'm like, oh my gosh, do I have a hangover? It's just, yeah. I'm always a hundred percent. And I love that. That's beautiful. That sounds to me like being more fully alive. Yeah. 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 I mean, again, when you're on the other side of it, you know, before that may not, it's like, no, all these, you get all these benefits. Guess what? Once you make a change and you experience the true benefits, you look back and say, why was I so blinded by this? And there's reasons. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Thank you for that. Okay. Question number seven, what's one thing you wish every American knew? I hope this doesn't sound repetitive, but it's really that you, yes, you can create habits quickly and easily. And even by making small changes, if you make the right ones, it can transform your life and make you a lot happier and healthier. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Question number eight, 
What's the most important or useful thing you've ever learned about making relationships work? You ask hard questions here. <laughs> I know, and you've imposed the one breath thing. Feel free to dispense with that. No, for this I'll, one. I'll, <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll go here. I, my partner and I have been together 25 years. Wow. And it's not like a typical relationship. It's, it's we're, we're a gay couple and there's an age gap between us. So it's really unusual. And so making the relationship work, especially when you rewind 25 years, everything was against us. Hmm. That's one breath. I think, and to be able to get through that and, you know, and our relationship gets closer and closer and stronger and stronger. I think it's two things. One, recognizing his strengths that they're different than mine. So I'm really good at school. I'm really good at tests. I'm really good at these cerebral things and whatever. And he's not that good in those areas. He, he didn't do any higher education, but seeing that his talent and he has areas of genius that are not my area. So it's understanding that there's other ways to be smart and valuing those. So in your partner or in whoever, your friend, your parent, whatever, value what they are good at and passionate about. Even if it doesn't track to what, you, you know, things that you've been raised, you know, to what, what you're good at and the yeah. compliment. Uh, number two, at least in a primary relationship, like a partner or a life partner, complementarity of the tasks that you will do to get through day by day. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, you know, who's going to take out the garbage? Who's going to cook? Who's going to clean up? Who's going to file the taxes? Both of you shouldn't be doing just one set. And so in our relationship, I think what's made it work is we have this really good complementarity where there's things that naturally are my tasks, my projects, and there are things that are naturally his. And that turns out, I just want to go back to college or college people and say, hey, people, you're not looking for the people that the person that turns you on the most. You're looking for the person who is your compliment that you love hanging out with and that you can get done the ordinary aspects of life and get yeah. through life where you're not arguing about who has to take the trash out. Yeah. I think that's really, and then I'll give a third one. Be very free with your praise and your expressions of admiration. And that's even true for strangers. Like the compliment, the thing that I did this morning with the surfer, he has a little truck that I thought was awesome. And I just walked up and said, I love your truck. And we talked about his truck. Wow. And I told him why I thought it was great. And so just what, it took 30 seconds, maybe a little longer because we got into conversation, but it made me feel good and it made him feel good. And it, next time we're out on the waves, which will be tomorrow morning, rather than not talking, I bet we do a little chit chat between sets. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. I think many of us often don't recognize the power that our speaking has. Yeah. So yeah, that's huge. Okay. And question number nine. So we've covered pretty much all the major things in life. No surprise. This last question here would be about money. <laughs> yeah. So aside from compound interest, what's the most important or useful thing you've ever learned about money or what's something that you're always sure to do with it or you never do with it? Wow. That's a tough one. Yeah. I can't. Well, my father taught me to pay off your credit cards every month. And I learned that when I was 20. So that's but that, that's pretty basic and straightforward, and that's helped me a lot. The more unusual one is never, and I don't know how I adopted this, but I started it even in college, never make big decisions based on money. Mm -hmm. So I didn't pick classes in school. I didn't pick jobs. I didn't pick anything based on money. I picked on, I'm going to do this because it's important and I'm passionate about it. And I'm not going to worry about whether I make a lot of money or not. And that's helped me take risks I wouldn't have taken otherwise. That's helped me do things that most people would not do. Of the, <laughs> of the what, 60 hours I work a week and I'm trying to streamline that down to 50, I get paid for a small fraction of those hours. Yeah. I would say eight, 10 of those hours I'm getting paid. The rest of it, I'm doing it because it's important and it matters to me. And I don't care whether I'm getting paid it's important and it makes me feel good. It makes me feel that I'm making the unique contribution I can make, you know, going back to earlier to help people. So, and I've advised other people in my life, like don't make decisions based on money, go with passion or impact or other things. Cause you're not going to starve. You're going to be fine. And you'll have a much more interesting and satisfying life that way. Yeah. You know, that's similar perspective that my, my parents have and, you know, my parents, as, as you know, included in my 
uh, email to you originally are very successful entrepreneurs based here in Utah. And one of the things that I often think about with them is that they, I really do believe that a huge motive for them was service, service to the community. And, and I've heard it said that if your desire to make a difference is greater than your desire to make money, you'll do both, <gasps> but it doesn't necessarily work the other way around. But I think it's I, true. I like that. Can you say that again? I like that. Yeah. So the, the, the saying is that if your desire to make a difference is greater, mm -hmm. is truly greater than your desire to make money, you'll do both. Yeah. I like but that. If you're but it doesn't always work the other way around. Yep. I love that. Yep. So. That, I, that is a very good way to put what I've learned and what I've adhered to in my life. And I think it's made a huge difference for me. Yeah. That's awesome. And for many other people. Thank goodness. Yeah. So that's great. Okay. Speaking of money, one thing I have done as an expression of gratitude to you for making time to share your experience and your wisdom with me and everyone listening is I've gone online to kiva.org and I've made a micro loan of $100 to an entrepreneur named Karen in Kenya who will use this to buy seeds and fertilizers to improve the quality of the produce she grows, which she can then sell and enhance life for herself, her family, and people in her community. So thank you. Yeah. What a you. good choice. And thank you for doing that. Yeah, my, my pleasure. Thanks for giving me a reason. Okay, so congratulations. You. Oh, the other one I want to make sure I ask is if people want to learn more from you or they want to connect with you, assuming you're okay with them doing that, what would you have them do? BJFog.com is the place, kind of the one of the landing places for my work. If you want to know about tiny habits, then you can go right to tinyhabits.com. I'm pretty easily found online. And if people want to train with me, there's a way to do that. But even if you want to just call me for 15 minutes, there's a way you can book time with me. So I'm quite accessible. And probably the starting point is bjfog.com. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Congratulations. You have now survived the enlightening <gasps> lightning round. Yes. After so many <laughs> well revelations and confessions. <laughs> oh, that's great. Okay. So let me go now to the writing portion of the interview. And we'll also, I don't want to say get that out of the way, but we'll cover that. Yeah. Will you tell me about the moment you knew, and I realize we haven't even mentioned the title of your book yet, but in the edit, I think we will. So okay. let me, let me ask, I'll, I'll say the title here. So we get it in the recording, but your book, tiny habits, the small changes that change everything. Okay. Yes. So there's your book. Will you please tell me about the moment you knew you were going to write this book? Yeah. So I started teaching the tiny habits method in 2011. And that was after some months, maybe almost a year of me hacking my own behavior with this method. And I was just experimenting on myself and it was totally working. I was like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. I can create all these habits. It's easy, it's fast, it's fun. So I started teaching in 2011 free in a five-day program. The program still exists. It's even better than back then. And then week after week, I was coaching 200 to 300 people. Week after week, year after year. So this went on for eight or nine years. And during that time, people would say, when's your book coming out? And on Twitter, people was like, oh, this totally works. When is your book coming out? And I was doing all of these things like research and innovation and tests and helping people. And I felt like I was discovering and doing so much. I didn't have time to stop and write the book, you know, because it was like this faucet was on and it was like all of this, what felt like progress was just, and I didn't want to turn it off. But then one night I had a dream that I was going somewhere to speak of some business, something or other. And I was in a plane to go give this keynote and the plane had a problem, was gonna crash. And so I was there, my partner wasn't with me and I was in the plane and like we do in dreams, we think it's totally real. And so I thought, oh my gosh, I'm gonna die. I'm gonna die. And the surprise, and even while it was happening, it's like, oh my gosh, the surprise was that my response to that was not worrying about what's going to happen to my partner or this or that, or the pain of being <laughs> in a plane crash. It was deep regret for not having shared my work in a broader, more systematic way. Yes, I was teaching at Stanford. Yes, I was teaching people tiny habits. And yes, I was running my boot camp, which is for professionals and sharing a lot of stuff, but what I learned from that reaction of deep regret is I really haven't shared what I have a responsibility to share. I really felt. And so I woke up and I was, of course, very glad it was just a dream. 
but I made note, I said, oh my gosh, I, my reaction was regret, deep regret and sorrow. I hadn't shared enough of my work. And then in the morning I told my partner and then that was the wake up call. And then a really great agent emailed me a couple of weeks later, who's done books for like Dalai Lama and Jane Goodall and things like that. And we met and clicked. And so the, that dream was really the turning point. And it's like, okay, I got to set aside all the research and everything that I, that feels like progress. And it was progress, I guess, to take essentially two to three years to create this book. And so that was the moment it took a dream of, and me really seeing what my reaction would be were I, were, were I to die on that day. That's amazing. I understand that you finished this book actually ahead of schedule, that you had a plan <laughs> and you adhered to it and you even finished early, which is very unusual. So it seems to me that between things like dreams, you know, yeah. and listening to that inner voice that there to me, I don't know, something I might call guidance. And part of it is this, I read a lot of books, like at least a book a week. And I can tell, I think I can tell when a book has been produced by someone who deeply cares. I mean, all the way down to the font and the, and whether there's typos in it and the way it's mm. organized and the voice and like all of this. And I, I really get the sense from even the way the book feels that this is something that is very important to you. And in fact, you mentioned at one point in the book, you call it a global intervention, yeah. <laughs> right? This tiny yeah. habits method is a global intervention. And I'm, I'm a little bit all over the place because where I'm, where I'm trying to go with this question is about how you managed the project. So you've been teaching this for years. Then how did it come together as a book, as a matter of practicality? How did you organize your time? How did yeah. you work? What tools did you use? Like this kind of thing. How did yeah. the book become a reality? Let, let me give the super high level and then we can drill down to some of the specifics. The super high level was of course, along with my agent Doug, defining what's the book gonna be about. And then with Doug and his team, outlining the book very, very carefully in massive detail and that was a bit of work but it was also fun because it was like a puzzle like how do you take this stuff and put it in a coherent package and so and then once uh you know there's a, a process of connecting with a publisher who's a, a good publisher for it and so once that was done it was setting up a schedule that everybody agreed to and it was just a matter of sticking to the schedule so not, and I know I don't want to make that sound easy, but yeah. that's kind of the big picture of it. The nitty gritty of it was, and there were for a book, there's a book like, you know, a book like this has many people involved. I don't have entire control, even over the title. I don't have control over the cover necessarily. The book interior design a little bit, but really that's a publisher decision. So there are a lot of people involved, which makes it a little harder about working with editors and my agent and stuff, just, you know, here's what we're doing in this chapter. I got help from my colleague, Stephanie, the same Stephanie, to connect with people who have had transformative experiences with Tiny Habits. And we set up these interviews and Stephanie and I would talk to them and pull the stories out of them. One thing that was really important to me was not to use composite stories, I guess, which a lot of authors do. It's not really a true story. They're taking bits from a different people's lives. And for me as a scientist, no, it has to be absolutely true story. So having a system to collect those stories and we only used a fraction of them, but that was super helpful because I knew I could write the conceptual pieces because that's what I was used to teaching. Mm -hmm. But then many readers want in-depth stories. And so bringing those in and working them in the right way. So there was always, boom, we're starting now on this chapter we need to deliver to the publisher, you know, X, Y, Z by this date, here's what we have to do between now and then. And it was go back to the outline. Do we want to revise it? Writing through pieces of that, getting input from my agent and others on, um, I'm thinking this story, what about that story? So it's not just me sitting there alone, guessing. I, I like being collaborative. And in this kind of book, it was important to do that. And then it was, you know, there, there just were times when it was like, Denny, I have a deadline tomorrow. I'm going to be up late tonight. It didn't happen a lot because I, I know how to create habits, right? So I created the habit and pretty much stayed on top of things. But there are those times where it's like, oh my gosh, I have to do a massive revision here. It's going to probably take, you know, you, you always think it's going to take three hours and it takes like 10, yeah. you know? So it's like, guess what? I've got to deliver this tomorrow. So it's just doing what you need to do to hit the deadline but not always having it be a huge emergency. Like yeah. use 
uh, you know, I, I definitely use my skill in creating habits to make progress on the piece I was needing to work on in order to cross the finish line. And we made every deadline and never had to, you know, call the publisher or whatever and say, hey, we're late or we need an extension. We just, it, it, we just hit the deadlines and, you know, and the, there's things and everyone who's a writer, the book's not perfect. There's things like the paperback's coming out. I have a small window to make small tweaks in the book. And it's so important to me to, that if there is something small to change that I do it, that I might lose one of my weekend days this weekend and spend eight hours saying, okay, now's my last chance to make change this word. Or, you know, there was a little problem here, or I should have said this here. And so there is a bit of an obsession yeah. about I've got, well, it helps that I just had this huge feeling of I, I, I'm here to help people. And these yeah. things were given to me so I could share them with others. I have a huge responsibility. And so even on the days when you're tired or it's like, oh my gosh, I really, you know, want to, you know, do something and not just sit here and write. It's like, no, you're, you're going to do this because people are waiting for this and you're going to yeah. do the very best job you can on it. And it's not yeah. perfect. I mean, I see more flaws than anybody. Sure. Na but naturally. the feedback <clears throat> has just been so great. It's just, it, it does, it does feel very makes you feel like you made the right choices and the right yeah. sacrifices. Yeah, that, that doesn't surprise me at all. And you know what you're saying, it resonates with me, but somebody once pointed out to me, or they said it this way, that books are never finished, only published. <laughs> it's yeah. like, oh, yeah, that, that makes sense. I but know. here's, so here's what I'm hearing <laughs> and what you're saying, a few of the things. And so feel free to correct or, or add it to this, but, but part of what allowed you to get this book done, A, you had something to say. So you, yeah. you were already delivering a message. It wasn't like this was your way of figuring out what it was. You knew mm -hmm. you had a true desire to serve and contribute to others. That was mm -hmm. authentic. You had a team. A so you, team. you did have yeah. a support team of professionals who were able to assist you. You had a structure, you had routine, mm -hmm. you had the benefit of course, of being a master of habit creation, <laughs> which that, never hurts. That helps a little bit. And, and still, so all these things, and at one level, they're pretty basic, but for others, you know, it's up to each of us to find our version of those things. But I want to maybe turn the question just a little bit. So is, what would you say to somebody listening who's either at the starting line of their own creative project, their own writing, mm -hmm. or they're mm -hmm. in the middle of it and haven't managed to push themselves over the finish line? What do you say to those, to people in that situation? Right on your book every day, even if it's just one sentence, don't let, don't let the book get stale. Don't let the manuscript, just at least one sentence that for sure. And then there's a hack that I did even before I discovered tiny habits. I did this with my dissertation was when you're going to end your writing session, don't tie up all the loose ends, leave at least one thing that you know you can do and it's easy to do. And I like leaving three and make a list of those things. So when you come back to writing the next day, you see one to three really easy things to get you started. And I think of it like an on-ramp. So rather than the on-ramp to the highway going up, it's a down-ramp. And so you just, so, so you know, and you then get trained like, oh, writing on my book is not that hard because I know exactly what I'm doing next. And these are easy things. And those things then build momentum and you will do more than a sentence most days. And, but just like make it easy to get back into writing on your book. But I do think the daily, don't let it get stale. I mean, there was a book I wrote 20 years ago where I stopped writing for a few months and it's so hard to pick it back up. So even if you're just doing one sentence that guess what, the next day you have to go back and erase or delete, that's okay. You're keeping the momentum. You're keeping the, the ball moving forward. Yeah, that, that counts for so much. Okay, fantastic. Well, thank you for, for breaking that down a bit. I want to transition to a uh, discussion about your, your book, Tiny Habits, and some of the ideas in it, if that's okay Great. with you. Yay. Okay, let me start with this. What is a habit? Ooh, the way I define habit, it's a behavior you do quite automatically without much thinking, it doesn't have to be totally autopilot, but you're not making decisions about it. You just do it without thinking. That's a habit. It's an extreme version of it would be like a reflex. Like what hand do you write with, with the pen? You don't decide left hand, right hand. You just do it. Or somebody throws you a ball and you just catch it. 
-hmm. so that you have a habitual response even to mm -hmm. the so that's what i would consider a habit now there's other uses of the word you know most famously might be stephen covey's book seven habits of highly effective people I don't think those are habits. I think those are like general guidelines or principles, like begin with the end in mind and sharpen the saw. Those aren't actually actions that people do. Those are yeah. general guidelines. So in the English language, we have at least, the, at least those two meanings of habits, specific behavior done automatically. And in the Stephen Covey seven habits case, it's like general guidelines. Mm -hmm. And then there are a few other ways that word is used. So that's why I say the way I define it is, things we do quite automatically without thinking. Yeah. No, thank you for, for defining that as we go forward, because obviously it's in your, it's in the title of your book. It's you know, what your it's work a messy is about, word. Right? It's an ambiguous yeah. word. Yes. Yeah. So why is it so hard for so many? Maybe I should just be, why is it so hard for me to change my behavior? <laughs> <laughs> I think the main reason why you or others is you just haven't been presented with the best way to create habits yet. And that's what yeah. the Tiny Habits book is about. There's just so much in our culture that sets the wrong expectations and gives us the wrong way, what I consider the wrong way, a hard way, a faulty way to change. So things like, you know, you gotta go big or go home. Even things like you gotta track your progress day by day or have an accountability partner. None of those things are requirements. Sometimes they help, sometimes they don't. But there's a big set of myths out there about set a goal and you repeat it for 30 days and it becomes a habit. And, and that is, works rarely. And so I think in my work, I am explaining how do you create habits reliably like, yeah. where, boom, you can do it and it's easy and it's fast and it can even feel fun. And I'll just end with this. One of the key things in the tiny habits method and what I explain in the book is pick new habits that you want, not new habits that you feel like you should have or should be doing. So shoulds almost never become true habits. So instead, focus on what you want and make those things into habits rather than, oh, I should be walking on the stair master an hour a day. No, pick a different way to have physical activity that you like doing, that you want to do. Yeah. You know, that feels a bit to me, and I'm listening now through my ears as a coach, right? Mm -hmm. when, when I'm thinking of how those that I'm coaching or speaking to, how what I'm saying will land with them, or how, in this case, what you're saying will land with them, and it feels to me a bit like a double bind because you've got, on the one hand, don't do what you should do. Shoulds feel heavy or burdensome. Do what you want to do, but that sounds selfish and self-indulgent. So what do we like, how do we view this in an empowering way? There are so many things that people want to do that are uplifting and good that they've not yet turned into habits. That's, you know, that's kind of the top line there. Because people often say, well, if I already wanted to do it, I'd be doing it. And it's like, no, you could just sit down and start making a list. Maybe you want to talk to your mom every day on the phone. Have you made that into a habit? No. Well, you can. And I bring that up because I've done that since COVID. Calling my mom and dad on the phone every day is as small as that is. It's added up to be kind of massive. And then if, yes, we all need to be physically active every day, but don't pick a physical activity you don't like, you know? So, yeah. or we all, you know, have healthy snacks, eat healthy snacks. That doesn't mean force yourself to eat kale if you don't like kale. Right. Find healthy snacks that you like and make those habits. So for almost any outcome or aspiration that people have, they're like you want to sleep better, there's a whole bunch of different ways to achieve that. You want to be more active, there's a different ways to achieve that. You want to be more financially secure. There's different ways to achieve that. Yeah. Go to those different ways and find which ones that you want to do and you can do. Yeah. I call those golden behaviors. Those are the things you turn into habits. You want to do that specific physical activity or eat that snack or be more financially secure in that way. Those are the things that you design into your life. Yeah, that, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. And to go back to my question about why is it so hard for me to change? Why is it so hard for us to change? Something you just said reminded me of this about outcomes and aspirations. I tend to think that's part of the challenge is many people are attempting to achieve a behavioral change when what they're attempting to achieve is very vague. 
Yes. Right. So you distinguish yes. between outcomes and aspirations. Will you talk about that for just a moment yeah. now? You, you just nailed one of the key problems with many systems of change. What does not work well is focusing on something abstract. Let's go back to frog and monkey as examples. So if monkey says, I'm going to hydrate more and I'm just going to motivate myself to get more hydrated. So notice hydration is the aspiration. It's very abstract. Where a frog says, I'm going to put a glass of water on my desk every morning. So it's very specific and it's about something he can do. The, the attempt to motivate yourself towards some abstract thing, even something like hydration, does not work very well. You know, like, yes, you can do it. I, you're going to hydrate and I'm going to motivate myself. I'm going to make a commitment on Facebook. I'm going to do all these things to hydrate more. And, and so the tiny habits approach is to instead get really specific about the behavior, make it really, really easy to do, and then make sure there's a reminder to do it. So you're not focusing on abstraction and motivation. Instead, you're focusing on sp what specific behavior, how do I make it really easy to do? And there's a variety of ways to do that. I discuss in my book, there's a system for it. Yeah. And then what's going to remind me to do that behavior. And those are the components of any behavior is motivation, ability, prompt, and the tiny habits approach. You really, you pick behaviors you're already motivated to do. So the motivation piece is covered. Then the ability, you make it easy and you make sure there's a prompt. So you're designing it in a very systematic way. And it's not guesswork. Those are the components. And those are the things that let you I guess, get away from the old fashioned way of thinking about change, like yeah. res abstract resolutions and I just have to be motivated to a tactical and very successful way, which is make it easy and make sure there's a prompt. Yeah, it sounds so simple and it is. I think it, it really is. But part of what to me was so insightful about your book is that you, you pointed out something. That's what I feel like, hmm. you know, again, what I've read, I don't know that it's in the thousands yet, but it's definitely in the hundreds of books. And I've never seen many of the ideas in your book. And, and what's more is not just that they were new or unique for me, but that I was able to apply some of them to change my behavior. And I love that at the end of your book, you've included a two minute script to help people <laughs> teach the fog behavior model, right? Why is yes. it important to you that readers have the understanding and ability then to teach this, this model as well? Yeah. Well, I'll just start with the most basic of reasons. So I love teaching. I, I love, 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 love to teach. And I'm always trying to be a better teacher. And as probably everybody listening to me knows that when people reteach something, that's when they really internalize it and learn it. You know, mm -hmm. they can hear you say it, but until they actually do it and reteaching is one of those things. So in my teaching at Stanford, in my teaching outside of Stanford, where I train professionals in my work, what I call boot camps. There's this thing I call a teach back where I will teach a concept and they will teach it back in small groups to each other. Mm -hmm. And teaching the fog behavior model is a really, really important teach back to be able to explain, especially in a business setting. Cause like, let's say, oh, we're going to try to increase, you know, sales by 20%. What behaviors are we going to do? And they say, okay, let's understand what comprises the behavior. Behavior mm -hmm. happens when and I'm going to the script right now. Yeah. And that, which I'm glad you are, by the way, because I know you just kind of touched on it in my question about abstract abstraction and outcomes and aspirations. But I was hoping in addition to explaining why you include the two minute model of teaching that you could then maybe give us do it. how you teach in that two minutes. Yeah, no, I can't totally reach to my, you want me to also draw it up? That'd be just, awesome. Just, just yeah, say that it. works. Okay. It's, yeah. it's, an, it's a real blackboard. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Well, now if the audio gets too weak, let me know, but I think this could work. Okay. So what I am explaining is called the fog behavior model. And this is going to take about two minutes, but this is the fundamental model about how behavior works, all human behavior. Which is a huge claim, by the a way. A huge claim. Yes. So, and we can come back to that and I will add more. So the model is like this behavior happens when three things come together at the same moment. There's motivation to do the behavior, there's ability to do the behavior, and there's a prompt. And when these three things come together at the same moment the behavior happens, if any component is missing, then the behavior won't happen. And you can visualize this in two dimensions. Along this axis, top to bottom, you have level of motivation for this behavior. And let's say the behavior here is donating to, to Kiva, for example. $100. dollars. 
So if you're for that donation behavior, you can be at high, middle, low, anywhere along this dimension. And then along this horizontal dimension, you have the ability to do the behavior. And that's also a range from high to low. But on the right side, I'm going to write it up as easy to do. Like the donation is really easy to do. And on this side, it's hard to do. So now you have a landscape with x, y axes that map out motivation level and ability level. And if somebody has high motivation to donate and it's easy to do, they're right here in the upper right hand corner. When they are prompted, they will donate. The prompt is just the reminder of the call to action. It's anything that says donate now. In contrast, if they don't have much motivation to donate, maybe they don't like the organization and it's hard to do. Let's say they don't have any money or the donation form online is really hard to use or something like that. When prompted, that person will not donate. There so, is a So BJ, yes, sorry, just real quick. That mic is obstructing the view. Oh, is it, here we go. is it, there you go. Perfect. Yep. There Perfect. we go. So these people here, because motivation is low and it's hard to do, when they're reminded, when they're told to donate, they don't do it. This line here I call the action line, and it's a kind of threshold. If somebody is above this line when prompted, they can be here, 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 anywhere above this curved line, they will donate. Whereas if they're below the line when prompted, so motivation or ability is low, they won't. And that's the model in a nutshell. And I probably went a little longer than two minutes because a few things, but that's, you can think of all behaviors in this. Now the individual differences come in here. What motivates people is different. A teenager is yep. motivated differently than say uh, my mom in her eighties. Their ability factors are different and how you prompt them is different. So the model applies to everybody in all cultures no. of all ages, but then the individual and cultural variability comes in on what motivates people, their ability factors, and how you prompt them. Yeah, thank you for breaking that down. And, and you give an example in the book, I believe that was a really masterful uh, use of, I mean, I don't know that they knew the model and used it maybe, but you use the example of the Red Cross. True you example, got, right? Like everything you talk about that? True. Yeah. Yeah. So it's pretty straightforward. I was working out at the gym, and it was after one of the the disasters in the U.S. And you know, throughout the country, we were feeling like bad and wanting to help them. And I'm literally on the the Strider, and doing cardio, and I get a notification like, "Hey, you know, click this button. Ten dollars will go to the Red Cross." So. The prompt was a text message that said, donate to the Red Cross, click this button. That's the prompt. The motivation was, I was wanting to, like millions of us, help the people that were struggling because of this disaster. So I was already motivated to donate. And the ability factor was, it was easy to do. I didn't have to launch a web browser. I didn't have to like write out a check and put it in an envelope. All I had to do was reply to the text message. So that donation behavior happened because I was motivated. They made it easy to do. And then they prompted me. Yeah. They said, donate now. And so, bam. Yeah, so that and behavior happened. I love that because it's another example where this can be a little abstract, but for people who are in product design or leadership roles, you know, or just want to live a more fulfilled life and design their own behavior, this is so useful. And, and I see where that prompt is so critical. And you yeah. tell another great story in there about being invited to dinner by some neighbors <sighs> where the prompt was absent. But will you, will you share that? Yes, this is embarrassing, but <laughs> so new neighbors moved in and they, you know, they wanted to make friends with us. So they said, oh, come over to our house and, you know, we'll have, we'll have dinner. We're inviting you over. And I said, sure, sure, sure. I didn't write it down. I didn't write a prompt on the calendar. Well, I think it was on the calendar, but there was not, it was like six o'clock. And so I'm not looking at my calendar at that point, my business calendar. And so that evening came along and we get a call 30 minutes later or something like that. And her, her real name, I'll just say her real name in the book, I call her Wanda. It's really Cheryl. Cheryl calls me and it's like, oh, are you guys coming? And I'm like, and in that moment, it just in a flash, it's like, oh my gosh. I look at the clock and I'm like, oh my gosh, we blew this. And I was motivated to go to dinner. I was able to go to dinner. I just didn't have 
the thing that said, go to Cheryl and Dale's house now. I didn't yeah. have that. And so that the, the lack of doing that behavior was because I didn't design a prompt. It could have been as simple of putting into my calendar system, remind me 10 minutes before. I just didn't do it. And so for me as a behavior change guy, I felt doubly embarrassed. You know, not only is it terrible to do that to new neighbors, but I just didn't design that behavior into my life. And it was just a, it was a rookie mistake that an expert <laughs> like me shouldn't be doing. <laughs> but you shared it and you've learned from it and you're helping yes. us learn. So yeah, no, thank you for that. So one thing that I, I'm really curious to ask about because I don't think you touched on it in your book, but it's about how can we use, how can we use changing our beliefs to change our behavior more easily? Yeah. You know, and that's a tougher question. A lot of my work, most of my work focuses just on behavior. Here's how you get this behavior to become a reality in your life. And by doing these behaviors, you can reach these aspirations or transform your life. The way I think of belief coming in, in the most important way, and this may not be the answer you expect from me, a belief in oneself and one's own ability to change, mm. a kind of confidence you can change. In psychology, you could call it self-efficacy or efficacy. And that belief is so important that from the beginning in 2011, when I designed the Tiny Habits program, that's what I measured week after week. I measured three or four things, depending on what year it was. But week after week, I would look at the results of, did I help people increase their confidence they can change? In other words, their belief, and in some ways hope, right? I mean, that's really what my work is about in Tiny Habits is it gives people hope. And the way that happened wasn't, and the answer is yes. And then I optimized the program so I knew that people doing the five-day program, the vast majority of them would report that their confidence increased or greatly increased, that they could change their behavior and create new habits. And I focused on that as the most important thing. Like, I didn't care if people started flossing. I don't care if you create a habit of playing the guitar, really. And I don't care if you create a habit of drinking water, really, as much as I cared about helping you increase your confidence you can change, because that's one of the changes that can change everything. Yeah. And the way we achieve that in tiny habits isn't by giving you a pep talk. And it's not even by showing you success stories or having you listen to testimonials. It's you putting tiny habits into practice in your own life and seeing evidence that you have changed something or changed a variety of things. So that confidence shifts not through information and not through a pep talk and not through, you know, a great movie. It's by right. you doing stuff and you seeing results. And that's, that's really what the five day tiny habits program is about. Yeah, no, that, that's amazing. And, and I love that view of, you know, this is about hope It's about empowering people to, to make changes in their lives that are bigger than any single change that we could yeah. make. And what you've said about, you know, motivation, I love your description that motivation is like a party animal friend, <laughs> that it's not the winning ticket for long-term change <laughs> as you, as you call it. You know, I've, I've seen that in my life. And as much as we talk about grit and we talk about yeah. willpower, that it never seems to last, right? Yeah. Motivation at least waxes and wanes. So what you're offering is just so valuable. And I think it's, it's something that the world could, could very much use right now. Let me, so just a couple last questions here at the end. You have a couple of maxims and you've already touched on both of these already, but will you talk about what are, what are these two main maxims and why are they so important? Oh, thank you. This is a, a good thing to share at this point. So what I'm sharing in Tiny Habits, the book, yes, it's the Tiny Habits method, but it's really a broader domain that I call behavior design which is an entirely new way of thinking about behavior. So it's not the old stuff. This is, this is why you and others will find so much new stuff in the book, because it is all new. It's yeah. not a summary of the past stuff. So there's new models. One of them is the behavior model. Models are ways of thinking about behavior. There are new methods. Tiny habits method is one of them, but there's other methods like methods for troubleshooting, methods for changing choices and so on. And then the third M is maxims, okay? So behavior design is models, methods, and maxims. There's, there's actually three maxims, but there's two that I highlight in the book. 
and these might be the most people listening that are watching, if you only remember two things, these are the two sentences to remember. Maxim number one, help yourself do what you already want to do. If you're designing for other people, it's help people do what they already want to do. Your kids, your spouse, your employees. So, and if you don't do that, you won't get lasting change. You won't get long-term engagement. And then the second maxim is also important for lasting change. It's to help yourself feel successful. And if you're working with other people, it's help other people feel successful. It's that feeling, that emotion of success. And in the book, I name it, I call it shine that internal feeling of success, that's what actually wires in the habit into your brain. It also motivates you to keep going. So those are the two things. Help yourself do what you already want to do. Help yourself feel successful. The two maxims are easy to say, but it took a 300-page book to give you the system of how to actually do that, how to make that yeah. practical in your life and how to develop the skills of change, which really leverage those maxims. Yeah, because that first one about help yourself do what you already want to do. I mean, what gets in the way of that? And I know that might be a very long <laughs> answer, but basically what don't we already do what we want to do? Why don't what gets in the way of that? Oh, uh, other people. I mean, the, the culture around us, uh, even maybe the way your fridge is organized. Yeah, maybe I wanted to ask you about that the super <laughs> fridge, by the way. Yeah. So there's super fridge. It's kind of an odd part of the book where I explain this thing, super fridge, where you arrange the fridge. So it helps you do, helps you eat according to your game plan. And it doesn't sabotage you by putting things in there that really aren't on your game plan. So part of helping yourself do what you already want to do is designing your environment. Uh, it might be skilling up and learning how and so on. And, you know, once, as you look at any and this is also what I teach people that create products and services. And that's what I do outside of Stanford as I run. And this goes beyond tiny habits. It's like, how do you create products and services that actually work and create a lasting change? If you look at everything that has gone big, everything in recent years, it has those two characteristics. It's helping people do what they already want to do. It's yep. helping people feel successful. There's yep. no exception to that. And so not only for creating habits in your life or helping your kid or your spouse create habits and create change. But also if you're creating a product or service, those are the two most important things. If you want lasting change and ongoing engagement, those are the keys. Yeah. Thank you for breaking that down. And you mentioned there were three maxims. What's the third? Simplicity changes behavior. A little bit different than the others, and I don't highlight it as much. It, it does come up when you look at the behavior model. You know, if you make things really easy to do, and that's the one that I've taught at Stanford for years and years. And in my class, it's like, hey, buddy, you know, there's no tricky persuasion techniques. It's just make it really easy. Make it easy. You know, some people think, you know, I have all these little tricky techniques of persuading, and that's not true at all. And what I've taught is simplicity. Make it really, really, really easy to do. And that's, as you look at almost all products, games are an exception to this. Games are an exception. They're not simple. And that's what makes them fun, apparently. But uh, <laughs> other things that have gone big, they've won, like Instagram. One of my students is the co-founder of Instagram. And the, the key, I think, in the early days, Instagram's a very different creature now. But back then, even in my class with a the team, they designed a little prototype of what then became Instagram. And, you know, they listened to, like, make it really easy to do. So it's this very simple way of sharing pictures. And then later they added the, the filters. So they didn't do it for the class project, but the filters help people feel successful. So even before you're getting likes or comments, you take a picture, you filter it and pay attention to what happens to you emotionally. You're like, oh my gosh, I've created a work of art. I've created something yeah. special. This I'm isn't a just a picture. Yeah, I'm a pro. Yeah. So it's that combo of really, really simple, helping people do what they already want to do and helping people feel successful. Yeah. That's huge. And that, I think there's so many keys to leadership in there too. Oh, uh, so much. I mean, if, yes. Uh, so if I can give a quick little manager thing is if you want people working with you to do certain behaviors, number one, make sure the behavior is very specific. Don't pick some abstract thing, like be financially responsible. Tell them exactly what the behavior is. Make sure that's clear. 
and make sure that there's something that reminds them to do that behavior and make sure it's super easy to do. And if you do those things, you rarely have to worry about motivating people to do it. If the behavior is clear and if it's easy to do, and if there's a prompt, something reminding them, yeah. then in the vast majority of cases, they do it. And you don't have to threaten them or bribe them or manipulate them. Those are all motivational strategies. So in other words, you can get people to change or to do behaviors without messing around with motivation, as long as you make the behavior very clear and specific, make it as easy as possible and make sure there's a prompt. Oh, that's, that's wonderful. Well, and again, I know we've, we've covered a lot here in a short period and a lot of it was at a, somewhat of a high level, but I hope people listening, if, if you haven't already picked up this book and you are interested in leveling up your life, that you read it, you apply this for yourself, for your family, for people you work with, it really is a pretty incredible guide. And, and what we've talked about, although it's maybe some of the, the big ideas in it, it's only a fraction <laughs> of what's in it. So a lot of good stuff here. BJ, any final thoughts, anything we didn't cover that you think is important? Any, any, anything you want to leave the listener with? Yeah, probably a lot, but I'll try to keep it short. First of all, at least right now, we're in a really crazy time in the history of this planet. And more habits have changed during 2020 with human beings and at any other time. And many of the changes we didn't want, right? And so when, when the environment around you changes, your habits will change. That's normal. That's natural. Don't get upset that you're not going to the gym or going to CrossFit every day. When the context changes, your habits will change. But on the upside, it's an opportunity to create new habits. Change opens the door to change. So now is like the perfect time. I mean, despite the anxiety and despite the distractions, it really is a great time not to make the huge leaps or, you know, no pain, no gain, but to learn how to make these tiny changes in your life and design these new habits into your life to help you with the near-term issues of anxiety and caring for your parents and all the complications that the pandemic has brought but also to help you be happier and healthier and skill you up in behavior change and how to design behavior change so you can tackle much harder things, things that don't feel tiny at all. So one, it's perfect time. Two, no reason to wait. I mean, this is an approach. It doesn't take much time or effort and you do not have to be perfect. In fact, one of the main things I say is you practice and you revise, so revision. It's assumed that you're not going to be perfect and that you're going to revise and you're going to do these tweaks and you will figure it out, you know, like how to wire things in. So there's no big jumps, it's tiny steps and there's no, you got to be perfect and there's no like public commitment. So you're not like setting yourself up for shame. So no. you can just get started right away and don't wait till the pandemic is over. Don't wait for the perfect time. Now is the perfect time. Oh, what a, what a wonderful perspective. And and I did want to let you know as well, the, the whole concept of shine and what it is really, I mean, celebration and what that is about joy and gratitude and just the privilege it is to be alive, which, I mean, let's be honest, I don't know that any of us feel that every moment, <laughs> right? But when, when you get right down to it, that's what it is. And I yeah. think that's just such a welcome message and especially as distinct from the disempowering narratives of you know, we're flawed and you should try harder and you're not good enough. You know, it's yeah. just, it's, I think what the world needs right now. So thank, thank you. you for that. Well, BJ, how can I, in addition to publishing and promoting this podcast, what can I do to help spread your message? Thank you. For, wow. I'm unprepared to answer that. Um, but <laughs> thank you for asking the question. I mean, what you're doing and what your listeners will do, hopefully with what they learn in my book or from the five day program. <sighs> I think my answer to you is this, just keep helping people understand that they can design positive changes into their life pretty quickly and easily and help people get started on the process. I mean, think once they start, then they're like, oh my gosh, like I got an email today. It's like, BJ, I started reading your book and I couldn't stop. I got another one yesterday. It's like, oh my gosh, I'm already seeing the results. So really the key is getting people started. So that's why I'm honing in here. So give yeah. people the encouragement yeah. and help people see that, yes, you can do this. And no matter how hard the challenges you're looking at, there are ways yeah. you can tackle it. And that's what I'm doing. In yeah. the audio version of my book by Audible, I recorded a special preface. 
that's not in the print version, but it's in the Audible version. And I negotiated with Audible to bring that preface in front of the paywall. In other words, you can just go to the Tiny Habits page and listen to it without paying nice. anything. And it's like 14 minutes, please go. I share a story there about the challenges I had with my speaking voice growing up which were, it was a devastating disability. And at the time it wasn't seen that way, but it limited me in so many ways. And I wanted to narrate my own book. And so I tell the story about my speaking voice and the disability I had as a kid and how I was humiliated from that and how that was this huge, huge problem. And then how then I use what I knew about habits and behavior change and tiny habits to get ready for my audible edition so I could compete against the professionals and actually narrate my own book. I wow. have a weird voice. It's still kind of weird after all the practice, but I did. I did achieve this big thing that seemed impossible of being able to narrate my own book and have wow. me, rather than a paid voice talent, me yeah. be the person to share it. And that was so important to me. So, and in part, that story is about no matter how big the challenge is that you're looking at, no matter your history, no matter the baggage, no matter the scars you've taken because of that challenge. And a voice disability was very apparent. It's not something you could hide. That you can make progress and you can have these successes that you thought would be unimaginable. Yeah. And I think that's why, and I'll just share one more thing. Cause we said, we're, when I wrote that before I, I narrated it, it was like the fifth day of me doing it. And I did it in a studio here in Maui. And I wrote it that morning because I wasn't sure I was going to do it. And then I wrote it and I went and read it to my partner. So it's okay. I need to read this because I need to make sure I can get through this. Uh -huh. So that preface I read and I broke down and cried three times during because I was wow. sharing stuff that even my partner of almost 30 years had never heard. Wow. And so it was that important. So then when I went into studio, I didn't break down. I made it through. But I think I share that just because at least go listen to the audio, you know, to the preface, it's free. Yeah. And I think hopefully if somebody's struggling with something big and huge, that just feels insurmountable, that feels like your body is betraying you. I mean, that's what I felt, mm -hmm. that there are ways to achieve and ways to move forward and ways to have reach milestones that you thought were impossible. And that's, mm -hmm. I guess I'll just stop there. That would be my final, yeah. my final thing to share. Yeah, that, that's amazing. And I know I've, I've already gone few minutes longer, but I, I just feel impressed to just ask one more question of what you've said about, and I'm so big on things that provide processional effects. You know, the things that one little point of effort can have an asymmetric return. And one of those for me that I didn't do until I read your book is the Maui habit. And now I do it with my wife and that's how we greet each so other. If we don't wake up at the same glad. time, we remind the other, you know, which let's be honest, I'm the one usually out of bed first. <laughs> so I will tell her it's going to be, but when you talk about the Maui habit, how do we do it and why does it matter? I'll keep it brief and you can have me expand if you want. The Maui habit, and I named it, there's only, the book is about helping you create any habit that you want, but there's one that I thought was so important that early on I say, hey people, here's one that I think you should be doing. After that, you can decide which ones you want. And in the back, there's 300 examples of da, da, da. But the Maui habit is this. After you touch your feet on the floor in the morning, when you're getting out of bed, you say, it's going to be a great day. Or you say some version of that. Uh, somebody last week said, she says, I'm going to make it a great day. Mm -hmm. So there's some expression. So it's like seven words. The other ones are like, I think eight words. And you say that first thing in the morning even if you don't believe it, like there's, I've done this for years now. And even if I didn't believe it was going to be a great day, I'd say, it's going to be a great day somehow. And that even that opened the possibility that I could have a great day. And it just, for me, it just worked amazingly well. And then I started sharing it and it works for so many people that, are, yep, I'm going to put it in the book and invite people to do this. It just starts your day in the right direction for sure. Yeah. And then as you reach an, a challenge or opportunity in your day, rather than shrinking away or underperforming, bam, you step up to that. And then the next one, you step up. So it's the trajectory, just it's going in the right direction. Yeah. And seven words, about three seconds, it can have a really big effect. Yeah, it does. It's huge. So thank you. Okay. With that, we'll wrap. So <laughs> I will just say thank you again. For me and on behalf of everyone listening, Vijay, this has been a pleasure. Reading your book was a joy. I'm really grateful that you made the time 
to talk today. Thank you Thank for you. inviting me. Thank you for your awesome questions and helping me and us share this with people, especially now, especially now. Despite living in an age where we have more comforts and conveniences than ever before, life isn't working for many people. Whether it's in the developed world, where we're dealing with depression, anxiety, addiction, divorce, jobs we hate, relationships that don't work, or people in the developing world who don't have access to clean water or sanitation or healthcare or education, or who live in conflict zones, there's a lot of people on the planet that life isn't working very well for. If you're one of those people, I invite you to connect with me at goodliving.com. I've created Life's Best Practices Breakthrough Coaching to help you navigate the transitions that we all go through. Whether you've just graduated school, you're going through a divorce, you just got married, you're headed into retirement, you're starting a business, you just lost your job, whatever it is you're facing, I've developed a 36-week course that you go through with me and a community of achievers and seekers who are committed to improving their own lives and the lives of others. So through this online program, you will have the opportunity to go deep into every area of your life, explore life's big questions, create answers for yourself in community, get clarity and accountability. If that's something you're interested to learn about, I invite you to contact me directly at brian at briamiller.com or by visiting goodliving.com.